Hello, this is Dr. Muriel Rand, and this video will be about planning task one for EdTPA, planning for assessment. So this is going to focus specifically on part D of task one in the Early Childhood Education Handbook. Let's get started. Task one, part D, requires you to explain what assessments you are using and to put in a copy of those assessments. So for each lesson plan, you need informal and formal assessments. By informal assessments, they basically mean formative assessments. So these are the ways that all throughout the lesson, you're looking at the kids to see whether they're understanding it or not. So again, they need to be throughout the entire lesson, not just in the beginning, not just at the end. Informal assessments allow you to change your lesson as you're teaching to meet the student's needs. So you look around the room and you see that kids are not understanding it and you maybe slow down the pace or give another example or ask a few more questions, something like that. Formal assessments also need to be included and the formal assessment, another word for that is the summative, is the final performance or products that the students do. This could be a writing sample, a drawing, a story retelling, and this should have a rubric to score the assessment. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. So let's take a look at some examples of what I'm talking about. Informal assessments could be observational notes from a turn and talk or from questions that students ask or answer. It could be a checklist on who is showing understanding of a story while you are reading it. It could be anecdotal notes on the language that children use. Formal assessments, on the other hand, could be a writing sample like journal writing or creating a page for a class book, graphic organizers. It could be a story retelling, so perhaps a one-on-one -on -one retelling in which you check off which part of the story they remembered. It could be an assessment of language use, like a checklist of who is able to use specific words correctly. It could also be an assessment of comprehension, like a checklist of the ability to answer comprehension questions, or just a comprehension test um, that is either oral or written. Let's talk about what you are measuring in your assessment. Your assessment should be exactly the same as your objective. I'm gonna say that again. Your assessment should be the same as your objective. One of the things they look for is what they call alignment. And that's what they mean. So let me give you some examples. The first example here, if your objective is students will recount a folktale, then your assessment is that you will observe students recounting a folktale and score, and, and score them using a retelling checklist. So you see how those are the same? Students will recount a folktale and what you're gonna look for is observing students recounting a folktale. Don't put anything in your assessment that isn't in your objective. And don't put anything in your objective that isn't in your assessment. Let's go to example number two. Students will be able to write or draw about what they observe on a nature walk. The assessment then would be student work samples scored for the quality and number of items that they wrote or drew while on the nature walk. Again, they're lined. They're the same thing. Example number three, students will add descriptive details to their narrative writing. Then your assessment is a work sample of students narrative writing scored for the quality and number of descriptive details. Hopefully that's uh, understandable to you. Let's go on to look at some sample rubrics that you're gonna want to create for your summative or your formal assessment. Here's a, a rubric for that same um, objective about adding details to writing. So your objective would be students will include sensory details in narrative writing, and this is what your rubric might look like. You've got three levels of your rubric, beginning, in progress and mastered. You could call these something else. You know, you could call it like below level, on level, above level, or something like that. On this particular rubric, I've created a column for the number of details that the students have included in their writing. And you can see that a beginning level is less than two, in progress is two to three details, and mastered is four or more details. And then I also have another row that measures the quality of the details. So in the beginning level, the details do not really relate to the five senses. The in-progress level, some details relate to the five senses. And then at the mastered level, all of the details relate to the five senses. Let's take a look at another rubric. Here's one for using target vocabulary. So the objective, students will use target vocabulary words during free play. And the words are garden, plant, seeds, leaves, and soil. So you can see, once again, this rubric has three levels. You can call those levels whatever you want. And 
and the first row of the rubric is the number of words that they actually use during free play. And you can see again, I have it ranging from less than two to two to three and then four or more. I have another uh, row that is using the words correctly. So they might use the word, but they might not use it correctly. They might have it refer to the wrong thing. So at the mastery level, they use all the words correctly. The in progress level, they use some and the beginning level, they use them incorrectly. And then third, I decided that I would um, look at the confidence in using the words. So again, it's not confident, somewhat confident and highly confident. Let's take a look at one more rubric so that you get the idea. In this one, students will be able to create a recipe using a title, five steps and a drawing of the food. So here is my three levels again, beginning, in progress and mastered. The first row is whether the students included the title and whether it is descriptive or not. The second row is the number of steps in their recipe. And the third row is whether they included an appropriate drawing that matched the food that they were um, making in the recipe. So then you would take this rubric and you would score it. So if a student did well in that they um, have an appropriate title, they get three points. If they included two to three steps, they'd get another two points. So that would be five. And then if they include a simple drawing, that would be another two points. So that would be seven points. And then later on, we're going to use these to analyze how well your students do on your assessment. Let's talk about special needs learners and assessment. It's important that you understand two different terms, modification and accommodation. And I love this little graphic. The modification is changing what students are learning and an accommodation is changing how they are learning it. Let's look at this in more, more detail. So accommodations are changes that allow a student to demonstrate their learning on the same content and objectives as the other students. So they do not change the instructional level. Modifications, on the other hand, change the difficulty of the content or the objectives so that students can be successful. So here are some examples. If you include uh, appropriate accommodations for any special needs learners in your context for learning statement, you might have things like using a computer instead of handwriting having questions read to them instead of reading them, getting more time for an assessment, using adaptive writing tools, or responding in their home language, for example, if it was a comprehension test. So again, go back to your context for learning and look at who you put in the section for special needs learners. Remember, there are three parts to that. The students that have a 504 plan or an IEP, the students who have language learning issues, and then any other learning um, learning problems. So for each of the students that are in that section, you should probably have some kind of an accommodation or a modification for them um, in your assessments, especially students with an IEP or a 504 plan. Now let's look at the example of modifications for special needs learners. Remember that the modifications change what they actually are learning to make it a little bit easier for them. So it might be fewer test questions that they get or fewer ideas or details are expected in whatever they, they produce. It may be giving them easier text to read, fewer words to learn. It might be giving them writing prompts for their writing or expecting fewer paragraphs. It could be a graphic organizer that's partially filled in so they complete less of it. So what you want to do is modify your rubrics. Here's an example. The top rubric in blue is the eating, adding details to writing that we saw earlier. And now the orange one is the modified one. So you'll notice that there are fewer details that are expected from them. And the quality of the details, the expectations have changed. So the beginning level, we would look for them, their ability to orally produce a detail on one of the sentences. For the in-progress level, it would be a few details and the mastered level would be some details. So again, we're making the content a little bit easier. The um, accommodations don't have to be put in the rubric. Only modifications are put into your rubrics. The, that said, your accommodations should be in your, um, in your lesson plan and your commentary. So let's recap. In task one, part D, you are going to include one file, 
that has a title for each of your learning experiences. So it'll say learning experience one, and then you're going to give the directions for the assessment, and you're going to include any graphic organizer, test, prompt, worksheet, anything that the students will use to show their learning. And if there is none, then just provide a description of what they will do. You are allowed to just videotape them doing their, their uh, summative or formal assessment. Um, so either way, just describe very carefully what they have to do. If there's a paper involved in that, provide a, a blank copy of it and include your rubric for scoring and repeat that for your other two learning experiences. Put them in order in which you're going to use them in your learning sequence. I want to also remind you that this is going to help you with task two and three. You're going to choose one of your assessments to be your common assessment for task three that you analyze in depth. You're also going to videotape your two focus students doing the common assessment, and you're going to need to videotape yourself giving high quality feedback to your students during informal and formal assessments. So you have to have those informal assessments so that you can give them high quality feedback during the lesson and videotape that. So again, in task one, what's submitted, this is the entire task one. You've got part A, which is your context for learning, part B, which are your plans for your learning segment or your lesson plans. Part C is just a file with your description of your instructional materials. Part D is the assessments. That's what I've been focusing on during this, th this video. And then part E is your planning commentary. Each of these must be in a separate file. I want to talk a little bit about scoring, um, but you're going to need to review some of this on your own. The scores are going to be reviewing your context for learning information to look at the required supports, the modifications or the accommodations that are needed for your assessments. So again, that section that you filled out with the kids who have a 504 plan or an IEP or English language learners, that's a very important section. And they're going to look at prompt five in your planning commentary where you discuss your assessments. They're going to look at your assessment materials and they're going to review your lesson plans. They are going to be looking specifically for the multimodal nature of young children's learning. We've heard this word before. What does this mean? Pretty much you can think of it as hands-on learning. It refers, this is their wording, it refers to teaching practices for young children that promote learning through the engagement of all their senses, utilizing varied approaches to learning and to demonstrating that learning. In other words, there need to be hands-on activities. They do not want to see the kids just sitting and listening or doing a worksheet or working out of a workbook. Um, you will not score very high if that's the lesson that you do. They want to see kids doing playing and moving around and games and centers and turn and talks and songs and movement. Remember, this is an early childhood lesson and they're looking for developmentally appropriate practice. So your assessments have to also reflect that. So your assessments overall must include more than one modality, such as social learning, play-based assessments, oral assessments, maybe art related to the literacy, observations of activities, listening, speaking, reading, writing. Make them, um, again, not just scoring a worksheet. Okay, this slide it has a lot of writing on it because it's just a cut and paste from the guide that is on Blackboard that is called Understanding Rubric Prog Progressions. So I want you to download that, print it out, and keep it in a binder and go back and look at it. This is Rubric 5. The assessment is Rubric 5. And there are four bullet plans here, four bullets. And what they basically refer to, the first one is that your assessments have to be from more than one modality. The second one is that your assessments have to relate to your central focus. The third one is that the the, what you learn from your assessments is ex they, basically it says that you have written down in your in your um, commentary that you will be able to monitor the children's learning so that it's very clear in your assessments how you're going to be able to monitor what they're learning and how you're going to assess it. So you must identify your plan and how you assess your your learning plan. So the, th the fourth uh, bullet list is that you have, if you have IEP or 504 plans, they must um, be addressed in the commentary and you must show how you are changing your assessment requirements, either the accommodations or the modifications. 
so that um, th those students can be successful. So you must put that in your commentary. It's not enough to just have it in the context for learning. In that understanding rubric progressions, there's also a section that helps you to understand the difference between a level two and a three, because that's important. You, you want to get that level three. It also tells you what will happen if you do a level one. So for example, if, if you focus on only one modality to monitor learning, that means like you just give them a worksheet, um, then you're going to end up with a level one. And finally, they also have a section that tells you how to get a level four. So what's performance above a level four? So I encourage you to go to the Understanding Rubric Progressions Guide and look at that carefully. So once again, read the handbook and the Understanding Rubric Progressions for Planning Task 1, and I'm sure you'll be very successful.